In our intro to Adeptus Titanicus, I glossed over how you construct an army or battle group, and instead suggested you play with what you get in the boxes and just make sure to point match. This is the open play option. List building in narrative match play modes, however, is a little bit more interesting. The rules for list building are covered in brief on page 53 of the main rules and are expanded on in the Legio books. Each Legio book contains all the manacles you need, so if you're a die-hard loyalist or trader, you just need to pick up one book. Picking up both books will mean overlap in the manacles, but there's lots of extra content with the Legio traits themselves. A Titanicus list is called a battle group. There are two types, a Legio battle group for the Titans and a household battle group for the Knights. We're only going to be looking at the Legio battle groups today. A battle group must have at least one mana pool. A mana pool is a group of three to five titans working together. This doesn't mean they need to stay within two inches of each other or anything like that. These are titans after all. If they're in the same city, they're good. Points allowing, you can have multiple mana pools, although typically you'll only have one. Each mana pool has specific requirements. It will have three titans that must be included and another two as options, which can bring the mana pool to four or a max of five. Sticking to these limitations gives a benefit, a maniple trait. So even though maniples are restrictive, the trait makes it worth it. You can add titans beyond those listed if you want, but they will be outside the maniple and will be considered reinforcements. So they don't get the maniple benefits and can't be in squadrons with titans from the maniple. For each maniple, you can assign up to two knight banners, of which one can be an auxiliary knight banner. Similarly, some titans like the Warbringer, Warmaster and Direwolf are considered auxiliary titans and you're limited to one per maniple. At first glance, the maniple rules seem to be like the detachment rules of 40k. You must have at least one troop and one leader and can have at most two elites and so on. Not so. There are tons of maniples. Enough that there's one for you no matter what combination of titans you want to run. The key with maniples is that extra trait you get. Maniples aren't a limitation, they're a bonus. You want to form your titans into maniples to get the best bonus you can. Next up, I'm going to go into some details of the maniples. We'll start with the options you can build from the core box, so that's two reavers and two warhounds. Then we'll look at how those options grow once you add a few titans in. I won't be looking at all the maniples, some like the firmest light maniple in my opinion aren't worded, while others require a greater investment like two warlords for the Mermelid maniple or a warbringer nemesis titan for the Arcus maniple. If you're at the stage where you've got multiple warlords and warbringers, then you should be giving me the advice not the other way around. I will caution at this point to say I've done my research, but I don't have experience with all these maniples, so take all of this with a pinch of salt. First up is the Venator maniple from the core book and it should really be your default if you don't have Warlord yet. You will need to play into the ability, packing your Reaver with the highest strength weapon you can and making sure it's in range for that opportunity shot. Ferox is the maniple of choice for the melee titans. If you want to try out a power fist and chain fist reaver, this is the maniple for you. You'll essentially get plus one to hit, as you can use your ballistic skill in melee, and your hits will be plus one damage. Don't think this is just for melee weapons though. Getting a warhound up close enough to ignore void shields and open up with a Vulcan mega bolter with this bonus, stacked with flanking and coordinated strike, can really be terrifying. We've just talked about the Ferox for getting into melee and doing some damage, and this Janissary light maniple has the exact same makeup but a different bonus that lets you move a knight banner after you move a titan. Compared to the obvious bonuses of the Ferox, this might seem a little underwhelmed, but sometimes what happens in the Ferox maniple is you charge your reaver into the target, but the target then just moves away, and you don't actually get to hit at them with your melee weapons. Clever play with the Janissary maniple stops that. You charge your reaver in, then your Sarasa's knights immediately move in behind the target, hitting him in place so he can't get out. Adding a warlord to the core box, gets you five additional maniples. I'm going to look at four of them, leaving out the Dominus because it's more focused on knights. The Axiom Battle Line maniple is the recommended maniple to build to and start with. The full maniple has one Warlord, two Reavers and two Warhounds, so you can have the starting starter box plus a Warlord all in the same maniple, rather than having to leave some of the Titans out. The maniple bonus isn't one you have to play around, but instead makes giving orders more reliable. Every order comes with a drawback. If you have emergency repairs, you can't move and fight. If you have full stride, you cannot attack and cannot turn. So there are definitely cases where you don't want to assign an order. That said, a Titan with an order is getting a lot more work done than a Titan without one. 
Normally, you'd have to balance the risks between assigning your first order to your most reliable Titan or to the Titan that you most want to get in order. This simplifies that entire phase and lets you get more orders on a table, making one of the big all-star manables. One of the benefits of the Warhounds is being able to merge shields. While the Fortis maniple does have some additional bonuses, allowing your Warlord and your Reavers to merge shields is the important part here. Having to be in base to base and not move is a big penalty, but that only applies to the additional bonuses and not the shield merging, which only requires being base to base. Best case, you're able to spread all hits across all void shields and they never collapse. That will require some good positioning, which will limit you tactically, but when it works, your Titans are invincible. The Mandatum mana pull is a bit of a mix. Your Warhounds get plus two on command checks, making your orders more reliable. When attacking units within 12 inches of the Warlord, your Warhounds get plus one on hit rolls. It's a fantastic bonus, but you need to get that Warlord into the mix and benefit from it. So if you're looking to build a Warlord that likes to get close rather than staying at the back, What's notable about this maniple is the combination of Warlord and Warhounds. This is probably the cheapest maniple that you can run that has a Warlord in it, letting you bring out some of the big toys for a smaller game. At first blush, the Perpetua battle line looks like a tanking strategy, much like the Fortis. But repair rolls can also be used to manage the reactor. This lets you more effectively use draining weapons. For example, a reaver with laser blaster, volcano cannon, and turbo laser destructor is potentially rolling three reactor dice just when firing. Given the emergency repairs order, in this maniple, the reaver can roll eight repair dice in a turn. It should be enough to shed the extra heat from the reactor, and any repair dice left over can be pumped into the void shields to absorb all the damage it'll take from sitting still all the time. The next two maniples we're looking at require adding a third reaver or warhound. The assumption we've been working with so far is that you've got one core box, but as we've talked about in the introductory video, two core box is a great start. That means you can run a three reaver list against a three warhound list, given even more options before you need to get a warlord titan. The only all reaver maniple is of course here battle line. The maniple trait lets them move outside of their forward arc, essentially sidestepping without penalty. That might seem like a small thing, but this is a game where positioning is key and this makes it easier to line up your shots and harder for your opponent to predict where your titans will end up. Next up, the warhounds. I'm only going to look at the Lupercal list. As the Ignis is a specialist flame weapon maniple, while the Canis light maniple is a traitor Legio Audax only. The Lupercal light maniple is notable as being the cheapest maniple you can possibly field, as it's got three warhounds. So if you're looking to field two maniples, the Lupercal is probably going to feature. The maniple trait allows the warhounds to reform squadrons at the start of each round. Normally you assign squadrons at the start of the game, and they remain that way for the rest of the game. A squadron acts as a single group during activations. This means you get more done during that activation, but you've got less activations overall. So your opponent is more likely to get the last few actions at the end of the round to do stuff like line up shots. Squadrons also have the option of a coordinated strike. Every Warhound in the squadron attacking the same target gets plus one bonus on the armor roll. They also have the defensive option of merging void shields, which we've talked about earlier. What's great about this maniple is you get to decide when you want the activations and when you want the normal squadron benefits. In addition, you can squadron up all five Warhounds rather than just a normal three. All right, we've looked at nine of the total 19 maniples. I've skipped over some for reasons, and the remaining six require either a Warbringer or multiple Warlords. Hopefully, once we've got three Warlords assembled and painted, we've played enough games to know what we're doing. We're not done yet, however. After forming the maniple, you get to select one of the Titans to be the maniple's leader and have a Princeps Senioris. When assigning orders to that Titan, you get a plus two to command rolls, making them a lot more reliable. They also get a personal trait. The rules say roll, or if both players agree, just pick. I suspect most people just go with the pick option as it removes the randomness and avoids the weirdness where the trait changes each game, especially if you're playing a campaign with the same princeps. Page 55 of the core book has six traits to pick from. My research suggests that the dominant strategist is one of the strongest options, allowing you once per battle to become first player, which lets you set up that big salvo when it's crucially important. The other options are not without merit, however. Ironclad Tyrant lets you reroll command checks for the maniple, making them even more reliable. As we talked about with the Axiom maniple, a Titan with an order is getting a lot more work done than a Titan without an order. Swift Killer lets you turn the Princeps Senioris Titan 45 degrees before making it an attack. You do get a minus one penalty, but as this is a game about positioning and firing lines, 
This can come as a nasty surprise for your opponent. The vote at seven of the machine lets the Princep Signoris add one to the value of a single repair roll. This might not seem like much, but changing a three to a four lets you vent plasma, changing four to a five lets you repair shield or damage, changing a five to a six lets you reignite collapsed void shields. So that difference can be quite big. While this is probably the tankiest option of the six, it also helps you manage reactor heat, which could be important for a Titan wield and drain weapons. Favored by Fortune is probably the most aggressive option, letting you re-roll a single d6 from a hit or save roll made by the Princeps Signoris type. Will of Iron has a very defensive ability that you kind of hope you'll never have to use, giving you a chance to avoid the first catastrophic damage roll. So for the damage roll, you roll a d10, and then Will of Iron lets you roll another d10, and if you equal or beat the first roll, then you avoid the result. If you're trying to work out which to pick, I'd suggest thinking about how relevant they are. One of the reasons Dominant Strategist is so good is it impacts your entire line, even though it's just for one turn. Ironclad Tyrant comes in next as it's impacting your entire mana pool, so lots of types benefit. The remainder all only impact one type, that of your Princeps Signoris. Favored by Fortune is probably going to be the most used. It's only one die, but you should be rolling plenty of dice from turn two. Similarly, Devoted Servant of the Machine is going to get plenty of use as you're making repair rolls every turn. I might be wrong, but Will of Iron really underwhelmed me. While it certainly would save a Titan, I'd rather take a more proactive trait and avoid getting in that situation in the first place. One of the cool things about Titanicus is the progression from simple to complex. You'll want to keep your first few games simple, but you can then progressively add elements like mana pool rules, legio, and equipment to add more flavor to the experience. If you're only playing with mana pool rules and aren't playing with the legio rules, then that's everything you need. Once you delve into the legio rules, however, you'll find that they do impact the mana pool rules. First off, every legio has its own traits and specialities, so certain mana pools will suit them better. Next, each legio has three additional personal traits, bringing the total options to nine. Lastly, and most interesting for me, some legio allow swapping titans in mana pools. So on page 89 of the core book, you can see the rules for legio Graphonicus, which lets you replace a warlord or warhound in a mana pool with a reaver instead. This means you can run an axiom mana pool straight away from the core box with the two reavers and two warhounds. Alternatively, you can get two reavers into your Venator mana pool. Only one reaver will be able to use the opportunistic strike, but having two will increase the chance of having range and line of sight. Hopefully, in the future, we'll have a chance to sit down and look through some of the Legio rules. That's it for now. Uh, one point to note, if like me, if you're planning on hosting games, avoid the trap of taking cool stuff for yourself. If you do find a cool combination uh, of you know personal and manipul traits, maybe let your friend try it out and see if you're able to work around it instead. Remember, the goal here is to have a good time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment. The goal of this channel is to give the best two-player experience we can for these games. So if that's something you'd like to see more of, subscribe to the channel.